But one of the things, you can't just slap new features into a phone. Signals are a lot like fish in an aquarium, right? You ever have a tropical fish aquarium or like you brought one pretty fish home and you're like, oh, this is very beautiful. And then you bring another fish home, different kind of fish, and like the one fish fights with the other fish. Or you bring a third fish home and that gives a disease to the other fishes. Like different fishes, it's a different ball of wax when you put different fishes together. You can't just add fish indiscriminately. You have to worry about the types of fish, the diet, the temperature, um, the health of the fish, and all these other things. The same with like signals. You've got different RF signals, different digital signals. You've got high-speed digital signals, low-speed digital signals, um, distributed. So the point is, in any of these consumer electronic devices now, you have this extraordinary ecosystem of transmission lines, and they all have to live together because, to some degree, they're all probably coupling with one another. And you've got to find ways to minimize that. So close lines couple because they share mutual capacitance and inductance. And I came up with a circuit model that we're going to see again in this lecture in a different form. And we defined forward crosstalk, which is basically a signal jumping onto a line, onto another line and traveling in the same direction as the exciting signal on the nearby line. Uh, and we said that, that that was a unitless, it was a kappa, unitless coefficient, uh, well, no, no, this one was not unitless. This was one over meters. Because basically, the longer you uh, stuck on the line, let me make sure that that's true, uh, time over distance, time over distance, seconds per meter. Because the longer you were on the line and the longer that you traveled, the more power you were going to dump on the forward direction of the adjacent wire. Uh, and then, of course, there was this other type of crosswalk talk where instead of the derivative of the signal putting on there, because you're using Faraday's law effectively, uh, backwards crosstalk, you were still using Faraday's law, but the waveforms reintegrated themselves because they're traveling backwards in the transmission line. And that was uh, KR or K, yeah, KR for K reverse, unitless. Basically, if there was a change on the transmission line, that change on line one would propagate down the line. It would take one transit time, and you would see a response up to two transit times on the reverse crosstalk channel of the line. In general, crosstalk is almost always bad, right? Because it basically is putting signals on your line that you weren't planning on being there. So if you go to decode information on the line, you know, your high-speed video line or uh, some memory line to, that connects CPU um, and the bus to the, the memory. Uh, those things are going to uh, always be detrimental. You never want them to crosstalk. Now, in microwave, in the world I come from, there's some times where you can use coupled transmission lines to build really cool microwave devices. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, but you can build couplers and circulators and things like that. Uh, that are that are useful in a laboratory and in actual real life. So that is basically what I want you to know. I don't want you to have to be able to do a full-on waveform analysis. Just recognize uh, conceptually what is going on. We're going to need these these concepts though for today's lecture, which is topic number eleven, uh, which is. Differential signaling on transmission lines. And I'm going to open up by posing to you a problem. Let's say I have a microstrip line here. So here's my dielectric in here. Epsilon R. Here's my ground plane. 
Here's strip one, and I'm looking at the cross section, so the Z direction, the signals travel along the line in this direction. And we just have a little metal strip on top that we left there when we etched away the signal. Um, <clears throat> now, there is a technique in signaling that works particularly well for high speeds and protecting signals. You know, we've already talked a little bit about field fringing and coupling. And basically, there are different types of topologies of transmission lines that are, uh, there's a trade-off, right? You, you have a signal on there that you want to protect. Uh, and sometimes that signal is a monster that you just don't want to get out, right? There's kind of a, uh, sometimes it's a very weak signal and you don't want noise and interference to come and interfere with it. Sometimes it's a powerful signal and you know it's going to cause problems for someone else, so you want to confine it. Either way, there are certain structures that are better than others at confining them. We know the microstrip is eh, fairly well. On the one hand, the strongest fields are right underneath the strip and fringing on the side, but there are some fringing fields up top. And that means a couple different things. First of all, if you put something near the microstrip line, you will change the intrinsic or the characteristic impedance. Uh, and if there's fringing fields above, there's always more of a chance to radiate your signal, lose a little power uh, on your line, and put it somewhere where it's not supposed to be, on somebody else's line or the pin of another circuit. And that signal can basically travel through the air or it can even travel through the way, uh, kind of like a waveguide through the board medium itself. In fact, this is a problem with FR4 at higher frequencies when you start clocking things very, very quickly. Um, the <clears throat> fiberglass resin that they use to make those circuit boards, those cheap circuit boards, aren't exactly homogeneous. Like I put a epsilon R up there, like there was just this one perfect constant that uh, characterizes the whole board. And the fact is that um, depending on how much you've paid for your board and where you've gotten it from, that board's going to have some level of inhomogeneity, which means it might be 3.5 over here. It might be 3.3 over here. It might have a little pocket of 3.7. And at lower frequencies, that doesn't matter. You just use the average value. You'll, your signal will work fine. But when you get up into the microwave free regime, which is what high-speed logic is, basically. You know, if you're clocking a gigahertz or higher, you're in the microwave regime, whether you realize it or not, even if there isn't an RF sinusoid that happens to be at a certain frequency in the microwave regime. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that, uh, that will cause problems, that inhomogeneity on the board. So we have to find ways to protect our signal. Now, what is a printed circuit board uh, transmission line topology that we've studied in the class that would work better than microstrip? Coaxial cable. That's right. That's right. Uh, except that, that that doesn't work on printed circuit board. You can connect parts of a printed circuit board to another, but if you had like thousands of coaps, coaxes looped around, you'd have the world's most expensive circuit. You'd never be able to cram it into an iPhone or sell it really cheap, which is what everybody wants to do, right? So what's a printed circuit board version of that? Uh, that's perfect shielding, at least at the higher frequencies. What was the name of the one where we sandwiched it in between two ground planes? Symmetrical strip line. Great, great. Not to be confused with the asymmetrical strip lines, which is when you put the little strip closer to one end than you put the other. There are certain uh, uh, printed circuit board manufacturing techniques where that just makes it amenable. Like they start with um, a regular circuit board and then they put two pre-preg layers on there. So it's a three-layer board. So you can't actually put the strip in the middle. It's really frustrating. Uh, and so that may not... There are maybe 10,000 different imaginable topologies for transmission lines on circuit boards. I only kind of hit the high points in the text and in the notes. Um, uh, so you have to realize there's just a, a lot of different options. And depending on the medium that you're working with, the type of printed circuit board, or if you're building up these structures on chips, you have a lot of extra options that we didn't talk about in this class. We just don't have time for it. But yeah, symmetrical st strip line. That's a nice way to protect it. But again, you need at least a three-layer board in order to do that, and that doesn't lend itself to really cheap uh, practices. Yeah? The, the, the 
vias, you pop down the vias. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's coplanar waveguide. That looks like this. Like, um, I think that's the one you're talking about, where ground plane, you etch channels away. So then you got a strip. And this is called coplanar waveguide because most of the signal is confined out here. There's a little bit in the air up here. But this is basically connected to ground. And they'll even sometimes put vias on each side. Is that the one you were talking about? Yeah, yeah. And if you put the vias close enough, it's basically like making a solid wall of metal. So that's kind of a way of cheating. You're getting metal in between your boards using a standard process, or the, between your planes using a standard process that doesn't really add any cost or complexity. Uh, you're just hammering in these uh, vias. I think I had one example of that that I passed around. Um, but that's exactly right. That's a really good one to use. Now, this is still susceptible, though, to noise and interference from other parts of the board or the universe. So one of the track techniques that we use for protecting our signals, strip two or line two, we put a second strip there. And then instead of signaling this thing so that I put a source voltage here, Instead, I put half of a source voltage on this one and the other half with opposite polarity on the second strip. And that's how I load the transmission line to sing, uh, send down the signal. And we call this, this goes by a lot of different names. This is a differential feed, differential signaling. Sometimes you'll hear it called double-ended because it takes two ports to excite the mode. Um, sometimes you'll hear it called balanced because there's kind of like this voltage balance between the two lines, plus V over 2 and minus V over 2. Um, so if, if I say all any of those terms, I'm talking about the same thing. Now, why would you do that? So let's do a mental exercise. Let's say a wave is coming in and it's going to put some impulsive noise on the line. Uh, a little blip of electromagnetic energy, the kind that distorts logic interpretation and destroys analog waveforms and puts crackles onto audio lines and that sort of thing. So it's coming down. I hit strip one, and then, I, you know, a uh, uh, few hundred picoseconds later, or tens of picoseconds later, I hit strip two. So they're effectively, I'm ex effectively exciting a very similar voltage at the same time on each line, which is going to propagate via the transmission lines equations with constant velocity into and out of the board. So now what I get on strip one is Vs over 2 plus some sort of noise. And then on line number 2, I get Vs over 2 plus some sort of noise. This is my V1 plus, this is my V2 plus. But if I'm interpreting this as with a differential feed on the opposite end of this thing, then all I get back is Vs at the end. The noise, which was excited in my little example in the common mode, uh, is canceled out. And so this is a marvelous way to protect your signal. Um, in fact, let me go ahead and show you a couple of the topologies. Yeah, of differential lines. That we're going to deal with in our class. Power this up. And I have the formulas for you for some of these. Okay. Let's see. Twin lead over a ground plane. So in this case, we have a ground plane. That's this dotted area right here. 
And then this is my line one, where I put my positive signal, and then this is my line two. So these are circular conductors coming out of the page from you. And this is after they wised up a little bit about telegraphing. Uh, this is basically the high fidelity version of how you send a telegraph signal. A lot of telegraph signals in the early days were sent um, single-ended, basically mean you had one line and it was above the ground. You used the earth as the return path. Um, and of course, that led to all sorts of um, interference, especially if you had like a geomagnetic storm. You had this huge low frequency change in magnetic field washing over the earth by Faraday's law, changing flux leads to a changing voltage. So you get this huge loop, this, you know, tens of thousands of volts or hundreds of thousands of volts excited on a closed path uh, that would be coupled. So if you want to send a telegraph signal or any binary signal really, really, really fast over a long distance, and I mean an electromagnetically long distance, uh, you would switch to a differential pair of wires. Related to that, this may not be the most modern example, but related to that, what if you take the ground conductor and you twirl it around wrap the two conductors in that. So now you have a positive conductor, a negative conductor, and this is your ground plane. This is actually, uh, you know how you have a coaxial cable? This is called a twin axial cable, or twin ax instead of coax. Um, and it's used in high-speed data um, applications. In fact, if you take your USB-C uh, cable apart, you will probably find a few twisted pair uh, twin lead components with foil wrapped around it. And it behaves effectively like this structure here. And I think I'm going to make you derive the formulas on your homework assignment. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> then we go down to the differential microstrip. Strip, that's the case that I put on, on the board. And then you can also do differential strip line. This is kind of like... Uh, if you've got the world's most important signal or your board's most important signal, it's like the president of the United States. You know, like when when I when they try to transport me, they just throw me in coach in a plane. But he he gets his own security detail plane with all these electro because you want to protect the pr president, the professor. We don't care so much about, but that's the important signal. So on that board, uh, this. This is like the, the Air Force One of circuit topologies. Differential mode, so any noise coming in is going to be rejected, common mode noise, plus it's shielded perfectly. And heck, let's use Fazio's idea. Let's put some vias around here too. Yeah. Because we want the pristine signal to come through. OK. So now, what I get to do is show you some circuit behavior of how you model this, because it's going to be different than what we've learned so far. It's still going to have impedances, constant velocity propagation, but clearly, if you have that line, those lines close to one another, they're going to influence influence each other uh, electrically. They're going to at least weakly couple, and in some cases, uh, strongly coupled. So don't, don't be scared. I have redrawn our mutual coupling circuit in three dimensions uh, so that you can get a better grasp of how this works. Let's take a look at what's going on. Zoom out here. Here we go. Oh, this is beautiful. I did, and by the way, I did put the notes up online. Um, for this one, as well as some practice tests. You can look at some old problems for our time domain unit transmission lines. Uh, but this, these, you can find the draft notes for this section up there. So <clears throat> here's my line one and my line two. And if you don't pay any attention to the stuff in the middle, you can see, oh yeah, line one's just like I learned in class, an intertwined uh, number of capacitors and inductors that transports a signal down to the end of the line at constant velocity. And they look over here like, oh, yeah, 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 That's, that, that looks familiar. But there's all this stuff in the middle. And all we're doing, really, is we've got the same uh, mutual capacitance bridging each per unit length section. 
So E is farads per meter, just like C. That's per unit length capacitance, coupling the circuits. And then these little inductors act like uh, mutual inductances, too. We have M in units of Henry's per meter, because it's also a per unit length distributed. And if a current goes in here, it's going to pop up a voltage on that pin and vice versa all the way down the line. OK, so that's our topology. Wrap your minds around that. Look at that picture for a second. And uh, tell me if you have any questions. Does it make sense? Uh, it was really that flat diagram with the board, with the two circuits, with stuff in between. You'll see why we drew it like this. OK, <clears throat> so we have to analyze this now with respect to a differential voltage. And we're going to use some principles in circuit theory to pull this apart. So I'm going to have to teach you about the relationship between common mode, differential mode electrically, and then even in odd mode excitations, which is how we analyze these types of symmetrical circuits. It's a trick. OK. So to draw things phenomenally, phenomenologically, and hopefully phenomenally, at the circuit level, this is the circuit that we're talking about. Here's line one. It's connected to something. I'll draw the top and the bottom bar. <clears throat> line two. And these are connected a lot like some of your sequencer problems in the common mode. Common mode, or sometimes this is called s uh, single ended. The source is connected to the ground on both sides. These share a common ground, typically. And then the excitation is placed at, in the same polarity on line one and line two. The way that we're going to deal with the signals now is we're going to put a voltage drop across the top of line one. And we're going to connect the bottom pin to the top of line two. And we're still going to keep the grounds connected together, the ground bars. And that differential excitation involves, you know, we have basically a two-port system now. And because this, we know that the two ports will be coupling to one another, uh, we have to ha pull apart the new value of impedance that we find for this. So this is my differential or balanced or double-ended excitation. And I'll show you some more realistic ways about how we excite this because one of the problems with exciting a signal this way is that, OK, I set up my transmission lines so that I can uh, receive the differential signal, and I, I reject common mode noise. But I can't reject noise that is already there. Like Sometimes my noise pops in from the source side, not from a wave that comes in. So if I have any V sub n, common noise could couple through this structure onto the line. We'll deal with that later. I don't want to confuse you yet. So pretend that's not there. OK. So even mode excitation.
I take those two lines, line one and line two, and I put exactly the same voltages on each one. So really, electrically, it looks like the common mode excitation I put over here. But this is nice because there's some symmetric property of the coupling that will allow me to pull out the effects of the coupling when I do my circuit analysis. Basically, if I study the current and the voltage I've attached here in this circuit, then I know that they share the same kind of coupling and there's going to be symmetry that will allow me to simplify the analysis and I will be able to figure out uh, what any kind of even mode signal will behave as. And then I go and I do my opposite, or uh, what we call the odd mode excitation. And that gives me a different, really orthogonal way of signaling and pulling out the behavior. And combining those two pieces of behavior allows me to study any type of excitation of the two-port system. So I'm going to put Vs here and then minus Vs. And this will make sec sense in just a second when I show you again what that circuit model looks like when I do even and odd mode excitation. Okay, so now let's go back to the document camera. And let's see, I'm going to put in a different equivalent circuit now. Let me find my odd one. Okay, here. Oh, no, even. Let's start with even. Okay, so here we go. Here's my line one signal. Look at this, multimedia colors. Here's my line two signal. This should be the same amount of current, though, because it's a symmetrical system. If I'm exciting this in the even mode, uh, oh, let me do it on this one. I grabbed the wrong mode. Here we go. Here's the even mode. Looks exactly like what I did, but I made a simplification to the circuit. Why? Okay, the current that's coming through here isn't just going to make a voltage drop across that inductance by way of our typical uh, V equals L D I D T. There's going to be a similar voltage drop across this due to the mutual inductance. And that effect is going to be identical. In fact, it's nice because we said whatever current is flowing here because of the symmetry of the problem, it's also flowing here. This current, which is this current, is going to make an additional voltage drop from there to there across the line. Which means I can really ignore this circuit and pretend that this is really just an L plus M inductor. M is the contribution of the current from over here, which is actually that current all the time, all the, anytime you analyze the circuit, because they're symmetrical. So it's, it is as if in the even mode, I I'm, I'm have a single line that just has extra inductance, plus M. And I got rid of the capacitance entirely. Why did I do that? Why am I ignoring the capacitance in this thing? So I just I can ignore this, this mutual inductance, because I by just adding M into all of these. And then why can't I ignore the capacitance? Because they're identical, so there's no voltage drop across. Exactly. If you have the same voltage on the same line at all times because of symmetry, then nothing's going to flow across there, no current. So it, we can just ignore them. That greatly simplifies uh, our circuit analysis for the even mode. And so for the even mode, we now have enough to figure out what the uh, actual impedance expression is. So for one line, which now has per unit length, per unit length 
inductance of L plus M and a per unit length capacitance of our original C for the transmission line, we know that the Z, and we'll use a subscript plus to denote that this is even mode impedance. This is going to be equal to square root of L plus M over C. Or Another way of writing this would be Z naught, my original impedance, plus 1 over M plus L, which for anybody who's taken physics, sometimes we like to call that the coupling, magnetic coupling coefficient, M over L. The self-induction inductance of a system is basically related to how much flux, magnetic flux, goes around uh, the wire of a pathway as current is circulating. And M is about the shared flux between two circuits. You can never share more flux than you've got, right? So the most this ratio can be is one. Um, and so that's why it gets this unit, unitless coefficient, which tells you kind of ballpark, how much is this really cup, coupling? An ideal transformer will have a case of M of 1, whereas weakly coupled transmission lines that you're trying to avoid crosstalk hopefully have a coupling coefficient of like 0.05 or something like that. For our differential lines, that cake could be large. It's not going to be 1, but it's going to be a significant number because these are intentionally close together. Okay, so that's my even mode. And the, the direction, so this tells us the ratio of voltage and current that the even mode supports as it travels down these pair of coupled lines. And this was derived um, with the two, this was derived individually for each one. So if we talk about common mode impedance, Z common, that's really Z plus in parallel with the other Z plus on the other line. So if we go back to the board and look at the circuit that we've drawn, the common mode where you connect the source to the top of both transmission lines, that effectively sees Z plus over two because it's two impedances in parallel. Okay, any questions about the even mode? Let's do the odd mode, because that's what we came, came to class for. The even mode is just Z naught disturbed by coupling. The odd mode, and keep in mind, look at this, this is consistent, right? In weakly coupled uh, lines, this M over L should be relatively small, so you can almost approximate it as Z naught, and that's what your chapter 10 of your book basically said when it was introducing coupling. It says, yeah, this is pretty close. Just approximate it as Z naught, and you'll, you'll be fine. For crosstalk, that's fine. For differential lines, you can't do that because the lines are intentionally close together and the coupling's too strong. But I just want to point out that everything we're saying is consistent. Okay. So the odd mode, let's look at this equivalent circuit diagram for that. But I'm going to do something, right? We saw, we were able to get rid of the capacitance, the coupling capacitor across the two lines, right, in the previous even mode. Now I'm going to make some ma manipulations that make things a little easier for us. Would you agree that that even mode capacitor could be written as the series combination of two capacitors with 2E value? Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Remember the series formula for capacitance like the parallel formula for resistance. You put two capacitors in series and you get half of the capacitance. So that's how we get from one to the other. These are equivalent. 
And if these are two symmetrical capacitors, and you know that the odd mode is being excited so that there's going to be some sort of voltage on this side and some sort of voltage on this side, would you agree that uh, I could probably just write a ground there permanently? Yeah, why not? It makes it easier, which means I could really, I could really write the circuit like this. 2E on the ground, and then this guy comes over to E on the ground. And so that's what I did. Let's go ahead and take a look at that circuit. Here's that same equivalent circuit. Odd mode excitation. So let's label this odd mode. V sub S on one side, minus V sub S, see the change in polarity on the other side. I split the C's apart and I grounded them, doubled up the um, mutual capacitance values, uh, and then just grounded them along the way. The only other change I have to make to this surf circuit is, okay, if I've got I going in on this side, what's coming out? I. It's symmetrical. But the polarity is switched. So, when I apply my Kirchhoff voltage law across this inductor, I'm going to get V is equal to L di dt plus the magnetic coupling from this circuit, which is going to be M di2 dt. But that I is really the same as this I, just has an opposite polarity. So my trick is that I'm going to just replace these with L minus M inductances. It's like I'm reducing the inductance for the odd mode. And so now I have L minus M instead of L, and now I've got 2E in parallel with C, C plus 2E total capacitance instead of just C. So that's good because that allows me to write my impedance expression. I've got per unit length inductance for the odd mode. L minus M and per unit length capacitance of C plus E, which means my Z minus odd mode impedance in ohms is going to be the square root of L minus M over C plus E. And if I want to, I can write this as, uh, oh, actually, two. I forgot the two. Remember, there's two E's in parallel here. So we got to put the two there. And that means that my Z minus is equal to Z naught plus one minus M over L over 1 plus 2E over C. And we could refer to these as like coupling coefficients. 2 uh, E over C is the co electric coupling. So we could give that K sub E, 2K sub E, and then we can call this K sub M as an alternate way of expressing it. Now, just as that was for each individual line, the odd mode on each individual line is excited, and we call it Z minus. That tells us the ratio of voltage to current that the odd mode accepts on this transmission line system. I actually had, that was just for one, one of the lines. And remember, I've got another one of those lines down here. So your Z diff, is going to be related to Z minus how? Remember, common mode, we had to add the even, or we had to cut the even modes in half because they were in parallel. What about the odd mode? Well, because of the way that they're connected, it's in series, right? If you look back at the diagram over here on the board, the odd mode is the impedance across line one and two, flip the source over basically to get the excitation. Remember, half of the source 
is going through here. So Vs over 2 is going to excite the uh, V plus over, or Z plus over here. Half of that source is going to be mirrored over here across a common ground. So the topology is such where it basically looks like these are stacked up in series to one another. So the differential impedance is going to be 2 times the odd mode. Common mode is piece impedance is half of the even mode. Differential impedance is twice the odd mode. Does that make sense? OK. Let's see how we doing on time. Oh, good, good. Plenty of time. So let's see. Let's do an example. What could I ask right now? What would be a good test question on this stuff or a homework question? Example. Let's say you go in in an, in an analyzer and you measure the impedance of your traces. And you find that a pair of nearby lines has an even mode impedance of 44 ohms and an odd mode impedance of uh, 58 ohms. Let's say when the lines are separated from one another, the intrinsic impedance you either measure or simulate to be 50, uh, 40 ohms. What are the coupling coefficients, the electrical and the magnetic coupling coefficients of this system. OK, what are the electrical coefficients? So what we're doing here is how we solve this problem. We say we know that Z plus is equal to Z naught 1 plus Km square root. And Z minus, put these as subscripts the way I did in the book, equals Z naught times 1 plus Km, 1 minus Km over 1 plus 2 Ke. So if we're solving for these, or if we're given these, we can solve two equations, two unknowns for k sub m. We just have to rearrange things to get them. So locked up in these even and odd modes is information about the coupling. In fact, the more different that they are, than they are, the more they couple. And so for example, uh, let's start with this one first because it's the easiest. If I write km is equal to z plus over z naught squared minus 1, I plug these numbers in and I find I get 0.21. Uh, 
That line would be lousy with crosstalk if you didn't want the signals to couple. Uh, but fortunately for you, uh, this has got some um, enough excitation to, to this, this is what we're trying to do with the system. We want them to be coupled. And then for KE, that's a little bit more complicated. We got to take the KM that we already found, and this is basically just the algebra for inverting that equation. And this is equal to 0.25 when I solve it. So those are fairly strong coupling systems of equations. I wanted to show you these two things. These are in your notes. And these are simply ways to excite a differential pair of transmission lines. This would work really well for an analog signal uh, in a way that suppresses not only the common mode noise that might come in and couple into your line, but also from the source so that you don't inadvertently couple it in by mistake uh, from another source. Um, and so, you know, in the original diagram that I showed, this. Uh, this was not, there could have been a noise source, a common node mode noise source. Sorry, I'm having trouble drawing on a paper and looking at the computer screen at the same time. I shouldn't do that. Just look at the paper. Um, so I can basically, if this potential, to, if this device that's just generating the potential is floating in free space, it can actually accept, and it was not coupled with this transformer, it could accept uh, a, a potential from wherever or set up at some potential that would then make it onto the line and transport down. The, what I've shown here is something called a ballon. And a ballon is a word, you'll see this again in your senior level classes probably. But it's basically, the, it stands for balance to unbalanced. That was the original definition, was why we call it a balance. I've seen that used mostly deprecated. It doesn't sound formal enough. Ah, balance to unbalanced. Balance. Like, now they call it a balancing unit, because that sounds more fancy. Uh, and a balance basically goes from single-ended to differential inputs, or vice versa and tries to suppress the common mode from leaking into one side uh, and back onto the difference or, or vice versa. So for example, in this case, we have a transformer, an ideal transformer one-to-one. -one. Transformers are great anyway for getting rid of common mode potentials because you isolate the two sides of the circuit, right? This could be, I could put one megavolt DC here, and it's not going to make it through the transformer. The only thing that's going to make it through the transformer is the average change in this source voltage over here, right? Because you're using Faraday's law, which is dependent on change. And so the ideal transformer will basically only put Vs across here. And like most transformers, if you want, you could always put a pickoff point halfway there. So you know this point is going to be grounded and exactly halfway between these two voltages. And that means that I'm going to get minus V sub S there and plus V sub S here. No common mode excitation whatsoever. There could be some noise that strikes this circuit uh, and excites a common mode later on in the line. And then in that case, you put the reverse structure on and you can basically get the single ended out with the suppressed, with the, uh, the common mode suppressed, right? You just do the exact same thing, put a trans transformer that adds the signal back together. And I get a nice V sub L there. Uh, another way is with an auto transformer. This is basically a coil of wire. It's just a big inductor, really. And it's like an ideal inductor. You connect a source to this. And the way that we've connected it up 
um, the exact same source magnitude in voltage will appear across this. So this will also be V sub S. And if you look at the topology, that means that you will have excited a negative V sub S, equal and opposite to V sub S. So I don't want to get too much into balance. That's it's, its own kind of <laughs> half of a course if you really want to do that properly. Uh, but you'll at least get the idea. So when you see the term balance, you realize, oh, this is a device that's going from single-ended to double-ended, suppressing the common mode so that I, again, protect my signal at all costs. Uh, and this is a good structure. This would work for any analog signal. I do have one example, too, of maybe a high-speed logic signal that uses diff single to differential ended communications. And this is a common strategy that you use for routing sensitive logic lines or sensitive data lines. Here's your logic signal coming in. It's a bunch of highs and lows, ones and zeros, right? You go in, you run one through a buffer and then one through uh, an inverter. Why? So that they're synchronized. They're all still in the same time. And you load your differential line with the signal and its complement. Transport it down the differential pair of lines. And then on the output, you can make a... This is something that's very easy to make with CMOS circuits, a little subtractor circuit or different thresholder. You can even use an op amp, basically. You know, they all function similarly. An op amp basically looks at the difference of this and then produces a very high vol, uh, gain value of the output, which really winds up just thresholding, right? You're basically going to get VH if this is a positive signal or VL if this is a negative signal. And you convert it back to signal uh, um, uh, single-ended output so that you can then do computation and what else you need to it. But maybe transporting it between the memory and the CPU, this is a really good scheme. Uh, or if you have a data line, that twisted pair with the shield around it, it's a nice way to send a signal, or the twin axial cable, something you want to preserve. Shield, reject common mode, um, interference from the line at your source, and at the output. Now you know how to make super high fidelity, high fast logic signals. In fact, I have a little exercise here. Let's take a look at this line. It says a logic signal one is transmitted on the differential transmission line circuit of figure 1.12. It's what we were just looking at. As the high, and we're, this is the logic that we're going to use. We're going to use three volts high, zero volts low. Now, if you look at the structure, that's technically going to put the common mode and the differential mode on here. There's going to be two modes, right? If I break down, uh, let's say 3 volts is there and the complement is 0 volts. That is really a common mode signal of plus 1.5 volts and linearly superimposed on that a differential signal of plus 1.5 minus 1.5 volt on the top and the bottom, right? So that when I linearly combine these, if I add common mode plus differential mode, I get 3 volts here. If I uh, add common volt 1.5 uh, on this line and negative 1.5, I get 0. So you can see... This is one of the reasons why we do even, odd, and common and differential analysis is because it's just another way to decompose the signal. Um, even and odd modes behave differently, and every pair of signals can be achieved by some linear combination of the two modes excited. So what is this asking? It says, how much current is being supplied to the source side to excite the logic signals? in this 3-volt, 0-volt complementary logic scheme. How much current is being supplied by the source if a purely differential logic system is used? So let's say instead of 3 and 0 volts, we use plus 1.5, minus 1.5. 
you know, from an information theoretic point of view, they're still three volts apart. They'll decode the same with this structure up here. I don't get any benefit from adding the common mode to that other than it just interfaces with the proper logic that I'm using on the left-hand side. Uh, so how much does the differential mode alone do? And then what's the power savings of transporting the logic signal with only the differential mode? Another good benefit of do, using differential logic and transport. So let's do the solution for this. I've got this typed out already somewhere. There we go. So let's see. We said my common mode or my, my even mode excitation, common mode excitation. Okay, the common, the, the even from the previous page we said was 300 ohms. And that's just on even mode excitation of one line. So both of the lines together under the common mode is 150 ohms because it's 300 in parallel with itself. And we said the common mode was a 1.5 volt source connected to both of those. So 1.5 divided by 150 ohms, that's how much current is flowing out of the source to supply the common mode. The differential mode, there was three volts from top to bottom, and we said you gotta take that uh, Z minus, the, the odd mode impedance, and you gotta double it up. So we said the odd mode impedance, I think in the previous example, was 200 ohms, and I gotta double it up. So I two times 200, so that's 400 ohms. So 3 volts over 400 ohms, that gives me 17.5 milliamps. And that's 52 milliwatts of power. In the second purely differential scenario, the source is supplying the following current. Just, just the differential mode. Exact same differential mode, you're just not doing the common mode. That's when you're using plus 1.5 and minus 1.5 voltage. That draws 7.5 milliamps, and it's less than half the power than what I had when I was using zero and a high number value. So look at that. You're, you're dumping much less power on the line, but you're getting the exact same performance. That's going to be less heat, less power draw. Um, and so differential logic is very beneficial, not just because of its noise resilience, but because it also... Uh, draws less power if you suppress the common mode. Any questions so far? Perfect understanding of differential transmission lines. They're not that hard. They're just like regular transmission lines. You just got to alter the impedance because of the coupling. And you have to think in terms of inputs and outputs that are a little bit differently configured. You often have to incorporate a ballon or some fancy active device to interpret the signal. But the benefits outweigh the costs in many of your circuit design scenarios. Okay.